Oh, excellent. We do have a quorum. Thank you. Would you? Good. I'll. Good afternoon. Uh, we now have a quorum. If I could have the roll call, please. Certainly. Senator Lowenthal. Yes, I. Senator Hancock. Senator Runner. Assemblymember Brownlee. Here. Right. Assemblymember Buchanan. Assemblymember Hagman. Esteban Almanza. Here. Kathleen Moore. Here. Naja Dabi. Here. Pedro Reyes. Present. Uh, Thank and you. I'd like to take this couple seconds here to introduce our newest board member, Nadia Dabi. Uh, is the governor's designating appointee. So she's uh, her first meeting. She just got back from some long travel. So she's looking forward to this, I understand. And Mr. Hagman just joined us as well. So, Dave, can I, I impose on you to close the door for us, please? Much appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we have the minutes. Is there a motion on the minutes? So move, second. Second. There's been moving second. Any comments, questions? Ms. Brownlee has also joined us. Any comments from the public? Hearing none, there's been movements. Yes. Chair Reyes and members, uh, it's not on the minutes, but it, because it's not on the agenda, I did want to raise an issue with you and make a request to the board. There's a public comment after the hearing, too. Right. But so I, you'd rather do it now with the totally relevant to the minutes? Uh, we'd rather do it now. Okay. okay. And it's dealing with sale of state school bonds. And the reason I'm making the request now is that everybody is here now, and I'm not sure how many will be here at the end of the meeting. My name's Dave Walrath. I'm representing Small School Districts Association. What I'm requesting is that the board make a formal action to request the Director of the Department of Finance at the next state's uh, sale of general obligation bonds to include a sale of school bonds. The reason for this is multiple. First, outside of jobs. The sale of state school bonds will have a stimulative effect. The very nature of putting money into the economy, because you have to be under 90 days under contract, we'll get money into the economy quickly. That will generate sales tax revenue and income tax revenue. Cash wrote a letter on this, a very broad letter, uh, looking at potentially up to $130 million of general fund revenue from each billion dollars of sale. Right now, we're $400 million below the estimate of general fund revenues, or $600 million if you use the Director of the Department of Finance's numbers. We have lost potentially another $200 million if the $200 million for Amazon sales tax doesn't come through. If that is the case, we're moving very quickly toward a trigger, a mid-year trigger on schools. To the extent that we can do economic stimulus when it's in our power and generate state general fund revenue, that reduces the probability of a trigger being pulled and a mid-year cut to schools. From a small school district's point of view, the first part of this cut is home to school transportation, a cut that will primarily affect rural schools with high percentages of kids from low income families. We are urging you to look at this, to sell the bonds, to have the stimulative effect in order to have both jobs, build schools, and provide a basis upon which we might be better positioned to avoid a trigger in the November or December Department of Finance or Legislative Analyst projections of state general fund revenue for 2011-12. So I urge you to pass that resolution, urging the director to do such a sale. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walra. Anybody else that wants to burn a bridge by going out of turn? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Go away. Go away. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Could I, I'd like to yes. comment on the, on the Mr. Walra's comments. Um, I do think that a uh, bond sale is important to this program. Um, we haven't had one uh, since fall of last year. Um, I understand that there was a sale on the 20th that was simply refinancing of bonds in California. And I know in the past we have both, um, I think, made such a, 
a letter, I don't know that it was a resolution, but I do believe there was a letter that came forward from this board um, asking for what Mr. Walrath asked for. And in addition, um, we have had in the past the state treasurer's representative come to the board and talk about um, the bond sales, which I think is important because our program relies on that. We have what Ms. Silverman is at 2.4 billion waiting um, construction ready projects. Um, and it can ha we know that it will have a stimulative effect. Um, and that's, I mean, it's the bread and butter of this program. So I would support such a um, resolution or letter. Um, and if we need to uh, ask for action on a future, at the next board meeting or sooner, um, I would support that as well. Well, I would just um, back up Ms. Moore's comments and hers would re reflect mine and I would be very supportive of that. Ms. Brownlee, Ms. Buchanan. Yeah, that, that's okay. I, uh, Sorry. I, I maybe what we ought to do is have someone from the treasurer's office come to our one of our next two meetings so we could ask a little bit more in terms of when we're going to have uh, the next plan sales and find out what they plan to include. Um, I also think it's critical, and I feel a little bit awkward talking about this because we really should be talking about this under new business. Right. But, um, you know, we, we also clearly, I think, have some planning to do on our part um, in terms of the remaining monies that we have between now and a potential bond. and. Um, you know, whether or not we're going to be able to ex extend out um, the new construction program, because if you want to shut down construction in the straight state, all you need to do is hit level, level three developer fees. So I think there are a number of conversations that need to um, center around this, but I don't know that having a letter now, I don't know when the next bond sales are. I think it might be just as productive to have a discussion with someone from the treasurer's office. Since we're all kicking in here, I think we did speak about in our last meeting or so, set up a subcommittee to start to explore those different possibilities, and I think that's probably the way to go to, you know, think that if we did a bond sale in the next 60 days, it's going to do anything between the next now and what the mid-year's projections are going to be. I think it's that's not reality, but we do need to think about the next year or five years from now and those type of things. And we did, you did mention to set up a subcommittee on that, start exploring those. I think we could schedule that and start working on that right away. Do we have knowledge that there will not be a bond sale this, this, this fall? I mean, I, I think, I think we need to have the information. I don't know. That we know there's going to be one. That, we don't that's know substantial that for this program. If there, that's a that's the longest we've been without cash, if I'm correct. If we don't have a bond sale this fall, um, that that comes to this program, and we have shovel-ready projects ready to go that have been ready to go for months. That I, I just think it's really an important issue, um, probably the most important issue to all the school districts that follow the work of this board. To Ms. Brownlee. Uh, I, again, agree with Ms. Moore, and I think at this particular point we um, shouldn't be discussing this but giving direction, and I think at least there are two members of the committee here that are asking to give direction. There's some discussion about a committee being formulated to discuss all of these issues. And if indeed that is the plan, I would then suggest also that we bring that discussion forward if there's going to be some subcommittee established to talk about probably one of the most important things this committee would address over the next year or two. So um, if that's the plan, I don't know if the chair is planning on putting together a subcommittee, but if that is, I think that which, that should be up for discussion. Uh, we did talk that there was a request for a subcommittee, and I'd like to point Mr. Hagman, Ms. Buchanan, uh, Stavon, and Senator Lowenthal to that committee. So take a look at that. And the purpose of the committee is? We were looking at, Ms. Buchanan, you requested the committee last time. To take a look, to take a look at uh, where we stand with, with uh, new construction dollars, uh, 
between now and, and uh, hopefully the next bond. And, and it is in our bylaws, it is the prerogative of the chair to do that without any discussion from the board? We, we've established those committees in the same format. We've established all the other subcommittees. We established that for the seismic. We've established that for the rules. We've established that. The only thing we have in the bylaws that requires a subcommittee, which we don't really adhere to, is the personnel committee. And uh, the vice chair is supposed to chair that. But this time around, we had somebody else. It, it, it was my understanding that committees were established based on consensus of the board. Uh, it may indeed be informal uh, consensus, but consensus nonetheless. But um, so. I just think that, you know, this is a, por a pretty important issue, and if the idea is to relegate it to a subcommittee and come back to the board, you know, for an up and down vote, I'm saying um, I will, would object. The, what, what the subcommittees have done is actually fleshed out a lot of stuff. When it comes to the board, not all the recommendations by the subcommittee actually get taken. And the, uh, the minority report is also provided to the board of what issues were brought up that the subcommittee did not move forward. So it is a, uh, it is a format that we've used on the seismic and the cash management last time and where issues were flushed out and then the board had the opportunity to hear all the issues again. But a lot of the going down to the weeds is, is taking care of that. If the, uh, if the board wishes to bring this up as a full board, it's going to be a very time-consuming uh, effort because the subcommittee can meet a couple times a month if they so desire, and they don't have to meet at the same time we're discussing all the other issues, all the other action items that we would as a board, but it is the will of the board clearly. Um, then I would like to, just for the record, um, be a member that objects to that, but if it's the prerogative of the chair. I have a comment, and maybe maybe it's a tweener. Um, I actually think that the bond sale is a separate issue than perhaps the remaining funds, the remaining fund allocation, which which if I think that's what we were talking about last time, needed um, time to to really analyze and air in a subcommittee. But to me, a bond sale is a pretty straightforward issue. It, and, and are asking for the benefit of school districts to participate in that bond sale, um, to me is a pretty, we, we can do that as, as a board and that's not something that necessarily needs a subcommittee. And we can have a report come back from the treasurer's office um, to the full board and to, the, to, our, to our constituents um, about that as well, which I think it would be timely in October. If there's going to be a fall bond sale, it's going to happen in October or November. And I think that we should, we should weigh in on that now, if not this meeting, definitely the next meeting. Um, and then what we do with, future, with the remaining ca uh, cash and allocations could go to subcommittee. And I would support we have done subcommittees um, both by appointment and by consensus. And if there's a member that might, if you, if, if you want to be on a subcommittee, I think we should support that. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's just that I, we can, if there's four members, we can add more people to the subcommittee. So Ms. Brownlee, are you interested in being in the subcommittee? But so, so where are we on Ms. Moore's, are we going to have the treasurer's office come in, in October so they can give us a report and we can express um, our concerns or our needs? I, I'm getting the senses that I was going to ask staff to proceed with that if you can have somebody from the treasurer's office come talk to us. I was reacting to the reference that last time we met there was a request for a subcommittee to look at the cash issue and I went back because I think you made the motion. And so consistent with that, I was appointing the members to the subcommittee, however, is not limited to that. But I think they're two separate issues. Well, I just wanted to follow up with what uh, I just wanted to follow up on, on Assembly Member Buchanan. I thought we were going to invite the treasurer to the next meeting or the treasurer's step to at least 
fill us in on the board where we stand as quickly. And then we can still have the subcommittee. I'm not right. too, too distinct issues. Too distinct, but I do want to have the treasurer, and we can have a discussion here also with the treasurer. I think there's consensus that we ask the treasurer, so I'm asking staff that we bring the treasurer. So that's one item that's right. been addressed. We'll certainly so, do that. So if we do that, and then we're going to listen to what the treasurer says, and then we're going to pack up our bags and go home, or are we going to then formulate and have a discussion about whether we want to collectively make a recommendation a around the sale of bonds for schools or not? That's what I I'd like clarification on. Mr. Hagman. Thank you. I think we keep talking around the circles. It's very simple. It's not an actionable item to do anything on it today besides direct staff to put it on next month's agenda. And, we, and I think the chair has made it pretty clear that we would like to have a report on it next thing and put it agendized so we can sit there and come up with some kind of recommendations, either formal, informal. They may have the answers for us when they come back from the report on it, but at least they'll be agendized next next meeting we have and we could be right on top of that when that the treasurer or the representative shows up he may get a email or phone call in the next couple of days and be able to get an update a lot quicker too um, if they have a date set if not we could definitely have agendized and send a formal letter a resolution whatever this body takes to try to urge that to happen that's one of the two items that we're circling around so that's one is that is that what the board wishes to have done mm -hmm. and one item I have a little add to it, okay. um, and that is that perhaps we also have a represent, representative from the Department of Finance because, as I understand it, many of the bond decisions are made there as well um, in conjunction with the Treasurer's Office. So between the two, I think we would have a good picture um, for what may or may not be planned in the future. <clears throat> I think the representative from finance chairs the committee, but I'll ask him. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that what Mr. Hagman said was following that presentation, and we would collectively collectively decide at that time to take action what it is as a body. And then the second item was, the second item was then create the committee because you referenced the. That we spoke about creating a subcommittee on the on the cash issue and the bonds moving forward mm -hmm. and we want and that subcommittee can meet anytime uh, offline as often as or as many times as necessary as we have done with the cash management seismic and so forth so that was the idea and at this point I've asked four members to participate if more members want to participate it's open okay is that okay so did we vote on the minutes I think we got no. public comments no. sidetracked let's, let's take a vote okay so it's been moved can is there a motion you, moved and, and Kathleen more seconded. seconded I think you're correct thank you uh, you need to call the roll Okay, Lowenthal? Aye. Brownlee? Aye. Buchanan? Aye. Hagman? Aye. Almanza? Aye. Moore? Aye. Dabby? Uh, Rays? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Cap 3 is the executive officer statement. Uh, there's four items I want to share with the board tonight. Uh, we are pleased to share with the board that the seismic mitigation program regulatory amendments were that was moved by the board in June of uh, this year was actually uh, placed in effect uh, in September of this month, uh, September 8th to be exact. And so those particular regulations are actually posted on our website. So again, we're enthusiastic that these changes are made forward and, and obviously increase um, some participation um, in the seismic program, which rolls into the item two, which we're presenting, is we're actually having an outreach event with the Division of State Architect and the Office of Public School Construction tomorrow. And that outreach event will overview the Division of State Architect and OPSC's project approval process under the new amended regulations for the seismic mitigation program. 
That outreach event will actually be staged at the Department of General Services, uh, 707 3rd Street in West Sacramento, <coughs> in the auditorium from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And we encourage all to uh, participate. And if you're unable to participate, please uh, tune in via webcast. Um, we are asked those folks that are unable to attend to go ahead and submit questions to opscnews at dgs.ca.gov in advance of the meeting. And again, we would like to have um, a lot of folks participate and we'd like to see a good turnout and hopefully that would encourage more folks to come in for the program. So that's great. Um, the third item we wanted to share is we actually uh, closed out a priority and funding round certification. Um, in May 2011, the board did approve regulations to create two certification filing periods that actually um, s collect data in July and also collect data in January. So the filing period ended uh, in August 25th of this year, and we actually had 187 school districts participate, which were related to 504 projects out of the 710 projects that's sitting on the unfunded list. So we actually have a need for the program of $1.3 billion. Um, again, again, shows that we have a need for the program. The certifications that came in are accepted, are valid through January 10th, 2012. And again, st stimulate that if we are funded with cash in the program and we actually do provide apportionments, it's important for those folks that provided those certifications to come in within 90 days. And again, we spoke uh, about the success in the program. In the prior um, filing round, we actually had all projects, ex with exception of one, um, activate all the cash. So $1.4 billion did go out um, for construction-ready projects. And the last item I'd like to share is uh, staff will be presented at the Green Schools Summit, um, presenting high performance incentive grant presentation. Uh, we will be presenting at down in Pasadena. And again, it's incentivized it's to encourage those folks who are uh, not really knowledgeable about the high performance incentive grants. Uh, we did make some changes to the program to encourage participation, so we invite all to attend that event um, on October 17th mm -hmm. from 1045 to 12 p.m. With that, I'll open it up to any questions. After consent. Okay. Yes. Yeah, uh, no, I was just wondering now, going back to the issue about the seismic mitigation program, whether we could have the invite, as a request by the board, the DSA, to come and really tell us about the implementation, how that is going, and what some of the issues are, so we can be apprised ourselves from the so, and I think it would really take a board action to, to request that from the division of the state architect to come before our board. Uh, it does have to be the next, I, know, I understand, but it really at a, at a meeting coming up real soon that we can really Put get it on agenda. Hand. Right, I would like to agendize that. Was there an interest by the board? Stevens saying sure, and Senator Lowenthal, and I'm, I'm looking for nods to concurrence. I, I, I concur. I just I, we'll kind of ask on the timing on that. Yeah, I don't know. I think yeah, I'm not. Because you want to have enough time after they've presented the regulations or whatever where you're going to have some kind of meaningful data one way or another. Right, or whether or and I understand that in our own timing, but I just want to make sure we move forward on this yeah. and that we have that and then we really have that discussion with the yeah, state architect. I agree, so I would leave, I think, when would be a good time to have that? Can we have folks come and do that based on what's going on right now in the field with your? Well, I think um, right now I know there are applications that are flowing through Division of State Architect currently. Um, and obviously with that presentation or education piece tomorrow um, and obviously tracking data as far as who's coming into the program at DSA, how many approvals are being um, sponsored through this recent activity, it, it may take them some time to extrapolate some of the successes mm -hmm. and who's really participating, but um, I think we're more than happy to invite them and see what's their availability. So we don't meet in November. No. We meet in December, and that's an issue we need to discuss. Right. So we don't do it in December. We do it in January. Either December or January. January. December, okay. if we can do it in December, would be a good time we'll to do We'll see. It. Okay, either December or January, one of those. Okay. Thank you. So I'm seeing that that's a good thing. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, thanks. And then going back to the December 7th, we do have December 7th as a meeting. 
Uh, if you folks could go back and look at your calendars to see what's uh, your availability for that. Because we will not meet in, uh, in November. And in October, it's a pretty packed meeting. Right. We have a full agenda. Full agenda. So if you could look, take a look at your December 7th and make sure December that. December 7th. We just don't meet in the, uh, oh, sure. yeah, it's, it's, it's around Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. We meet like, what, the third weekend? Yeah. I think it falls on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Right. Yeah. So anyway, so if you can just look at your calendar and let, me, let Sue know, let folks know whether or not that's a date that works for you, December 7th, mm -hmm. so that we can start looking for alternative dates quickly. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? And Any other questions? Any other comments? Nope. Okay, moving on. Consent agenda, and if I may, if we can include tab eight as part of the special consent, and that's the uh, two school districts repayment over a five-year period. I think is non-contentious. Conscientious. Uh, everybody seems to be okay with that. We can move that to the consent as well. So, Mr. so move, Mr. Chair. It's been moved with the consent plus the special item. It's been moved in second. All in favor say aye. 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 I just have a comment. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if we can ask our um, rules subcommittee to revisit the special consents because it seems that we each meeting are doing it de facto um, by, by, by putting items that are not in, that are in the um, regular items into, con, in con, into consent. And we used to have consent. Um, what were they called? These consent special specials. Consent specials that were agreed upon. Op the the district and the the staff uh, both agreed upon an item, and so it went into one that could be adopted um, by consent. And I'm wondering if we could have our committee relook at that, or if we could relook at that as a board because we seem to do it each meeting de facto. Yeah, it's and, and I kind of brought it up because some of the stuff that is. Everybody's in agreement why I argue about it, why you waste people's time. And but I was told that they used to have it and the board asked that it be each item individual action be taken. So okay, going back. No, it's fair. Yeah, so maybe we could revisit mm -hmm. that if that's Sounds good. If that's how that, that subcommittee recommends that and says that's how we sure. should then I'm Absolutely. I'm good. I just thought it seems we're doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. Why don't we revisit it? Absolutely. So we should bring it up to Senator Hancock and her committee. Tap four. We did tap four. So moving on to the financials and tab five. Yes. So just to share with the board a status of fund releases, um, I'll just jump to page 71. Um, out of the, all the five bonds uh, that we actually are tracking since April 2009, we did actually liquidate um, on page 71, $71.7 million um, last month. and. A great deal of that activity actually relates to the March 2010 bond sale. So um, that's great news. Uh, most of that money that was committed in the old 18-month time requirement in which we've, we've been successfully tracking. On page 72, we just wanted to share with the board that we still have $223 million um, in cash in our account as of the end of August. And But it just if you just look at the chart, uh, again, phenomenal that we received, uh, we had a lot of money from the last bond sale in November, but we had over $2 billion at one point in time in our account as of the end of last year, and we've actually worked successful in liquidating um, a huge amount of money there, and that speaks to the needs of the program, and so we ha still have $223 million. And then on page 73, we've been charting those projects that are on the time limit of fund releases. Um, to what extent are those folks that have 18 months um, commitments and are they liquidating? And then with this chart on page 73 illustrates that we still have 22 projects in October uh, with a value of $110 million that has actually time to come in to activate that cash. And again, we're encouraging those folks that are sitting out there, um, and if you have 50% of the contracts in place for construction to move forward um, and access the cash that's available. And with that, uh, 
speaking to the old requirements, there's about $168 million that's sitting out there. So again, it's extremely important for those folks that have timelines in October to come in and activate their cash. So if there's any questions, I can move forward to tab six. Is there any comments from the public? Move forward. Tab six, um, status of funds, I apologize, it was late today. Um, was delivered. We were definitely trying to reconcile um, some of the preliminary apportionments or the activations of the charter project, so apologize for any delays in advance. Uh, what we wanted to share in Proposition 1D, uh, we actually did process $40.8 million this month, and a great deal of those projects came from the modernization. 18 projects were processed for $51.3 million, four projects in high performance, and converted $10.9 million in the charter program. And then Proposition 55, we processed three applications of new construction for 10.6 million, and again converted some charter projects. So in total, 6.8 million dollars were provided on the unfunded list. In Proposition 47, uh, we processed two applications of new construction for 6.1 million. In total, for the month, 53.7 million processed for 31 applications. So we still have, we actually have a need of 2.3 billion dollars. Um, on the unfunded list, and that will accumulate as a result of additional uh, approvals provided this month. This activity on page 75, there's actually no activity on Hold tab on a sec, 75. we have a question. Sure. I have a question on 74, and I'm just, um, it's not a question, it's actually a, a, an ask, and that is on the items that have the small c that says um, the authority is not available at this time, if we can further explain that, because I do know that folks look at this list and they look at the bond authority remaining and they make decisions in their school districts accordingly. And if in fact there really isn't the authority available, and I know there's, there's you've, you've talked to us before about reasons that happens or, you know, it's not really available, if that can be quantified so that a district could look at this list or, or I could look at this list or any board member and know exactly what authority is remaining that can be utilized and, and somehow distinguish that, um, because this is a great chart and I know people rely on it a lot. Um, and I just ask that that be, that be clarified. Yeah, and we can certainly do that. I think most of that C, and not the entire amount, but there is a small portion that maybe uh, we need to collect on accounts receivable that would obviously credit back uh, the authority once we've collected it. So again, it, I can provide some further explanation. Or month. even, or even, Ms. Silverman, even if it's if it's in, if it's very little, then let's not put that the footnote, and I think it all will work out in the end. But if it's substantial, if, you know, we have 63 million and only 3 million of it is really available to be allocated, that's substantial. But if it's the opposite, that maybe 1 I, I million of it. I believe it's the opposite, to be quite And I don't know that we should caveat them as much, or, or at least we quantify that caveat, because, again, people rely on this information to make decisions in their districts, and, and it, it, it's, it would be helpful to know what truly is available to the board for allocation. Yeah, we'll do that. Thank you. So if there's any questions, we can save ourselves in the pie charts if you like, um, but I'll open it up to any questions. Any questions or comments? Okay. Let me do an update. Uh, Senator Runner has requested that we put off on the PIW. Uh, she wants to participate on that, and obviously she's not here today, so with that, Objection. We'll go ahead and hold off on that one. Twelve. No, item number twelve. And then we do have a, a close personnel matter that, if it's okay with the board, we can do now because I know some members need to leave early. Mm -hmm. And if we can take care of that, yes. and then we can then come back and finish our agenda. Is that okay? Can I ask one quick question? Yes. Are we going to do that on in October or December? I just would ask you to take a look at the agendas because October. October is pretty booked already, so we may end up doing that in December, the the PIW. So you just give people a heads up, okay? But good point, thank you, because we had talked about how booked it's already and getting there, okay? So if we could um, clear the room for a quick closed session, a personnel matter. <laughs> Yeah.
Okay, I'm getting the thumbs up. Thank you. Uh, we're coming back from closed session. We are pleased to report that um, Bill Savage has accepted a position of assistant executive officer. For those of you that do not know Bill, which is probably two people outside, but Bill, would you please stand up so they know who you are? Thank you. Uh, and we now move on to action items. We uh, dispense with item eight, item nine, Oak, Oak Grove Elementary material inaccuracy issue. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, board members. My name is Rick Asbell. I'm the fiscal operations manager with OPSC. If you would please go to stamp page 107. The purpose of this report is to request the board find that a material inaccuracy has occurred which resulted in a funding advantage for the Oak Grove Elementary School District. Additionally, to request to levy this statutory interest penalty and loss of self-certification penalty. During an expenditure review of five of the district's projects, it was discovered that the district falsely certified on the fund releases. By falsely certifying, the district received a funding advantage on those projects. The five projects are listed on attachment C, stamp page 114. The cumulative days out of compliance for these projects is 2,436 days. This could be potentially the district's first potential uh, finding of a material inaccuracy. If the board finds that the district has a material inaccuracy, the board shall require the district to repay a statutory interest penalty in the amount of $540,386. The district agrees with the premature fund release for these projects, and it agrees to repay the amount owed. However, the district requests that the board act with leniency in determining the loss of self-certification penalty. At the bottom of stamp page 109, we've laid out the recommendations, which are consistent with material inaccuracy law, regulation, and past board actions. They are as follows. Find that a material inaccuracy occurred for each SFP application listed on attachment C, stamp page 114. Require the district to repay $540,386 on attachment C. Prohibit the district from loss of self-certification for a period of five years until September 28, 2016. I'm open to any questions. Is anybody from the district here that wants to speak? Please, sir, step forward. Thank you. Um, I am Chris Chu. I'm actually the CBO of the school district as well as the acting superintendent right now. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to come talk to you about this particular item. Um, as the letter had stated in, in, in your board packets, the district does agree that there was a premature um, uh, fund release of some funds uh, that the district had requested. Uh, we do feel that we do have to pay back the interest, but we do strongly have concerns about the uh, statutory interest rates on interest penalties, and we do have some concerns around the self-certification penalty. Um, I fully understand as the CBO of the district, I wasn't here at the time, the importance of making sure that the 50% of the contracts under, 50% um, of the projects under contract at the time that the fund release is imperative and that is what every other district agrees to. So I make no excuses as to the reasons why the, the former administration did that. However, I, I can assure the board at this point in time as we move forward, uh, we do have processes processes in place so that stuff like this does not ever happen again. Um, I do want to speak in regards to what, uh, the conversation that the board had earlier about shovel-ready projects. The fact of the matter is that the interest penalty amounts to over $500,000. Um, we've, been, we've been holding this money aside for the last five years. Um, we've been working with uh, OPSC, and I, and I do appreciate the, the time that the staff has been putting in towards putting together the final conclusion of the audit. But it, again, it's, been take, it's taken five years, and um, five years we could have done something with, with this funds. And so I, I do want to just say that um, you know, uh, uh, if, if you're going to penalize us, that's fine. If you aren't going to penalize us, then allow us to do what we need to do and put a few more people to work with this $500,000. Thank you. So just so I understand, so you're, you agree on the 540, and you're asking for leniency on the repayment of it, or you already have the money set aside for this, so you're asking for leniency on the certification? Uh, we're only asking leniency on the self-certification. 
when did this issue come up first? How um, have we had this going back and forth? I came to the school district in 2006, and the audit was going on prior to my arrival, okay. and I've been involved with it ever since. How long have we been prepared or ready to move forward on this issue? Could have come to the board. Well, there was issues as far as whether or not the board had the appetite to take up some of the material inaccuracy issues. So there has been projects waiting in the bay. It's um, waiting to move forward as well. So um, there has probably been almost a two and a half year hiatus on those issues. So, so under current regulations, the five years starts when the board makes the finding. That's correct. And so is there any flexibility to start the clock of when there was agreement that there was material inaccuracy with the school district between OPSC and the, that we could have come to the board had we had a better <coughs> scheduling system or whatever it is to put the issues before the board? That, that again, it provides, provides the board the flexibility as far as where do you want to impose this loss of cell cert. Okay. So that's strictly upon the board's recommendation. Mr. Hagman. Well, I just want to make sure I understand this. So, I mean, this has been a very long period of time for this particular case. The school district was found to not meet the criteria for a certain period of time. A, how long did that take us to figure that out? Then once we did figure it out, have we slowed the process for it coming back to us for adjudication, so to speak? Um, can someone who kind of more explain that time? I had to go for seven years, you know, basically, or whatever it's been, to you know make this ha happen. Is that on school districts, basically timeline? Because we were waiting for things from them, or is it in our timeline? Um, just trying to figure out the the difference, maybe. Can uh, I address that really quick? So when we we see a potential material inaccuracy, especially with a 5005, there are numerous conversations that would happen with the district and the representatives. Uh, we look under every look at every single avenue to try to um, perfect to basically the 5005 issue. So when we initially find it, it could be, you know, at some point, but as time goes on, while we're trying to find additional information to take care of this issue, that's where some of the time lag comes into play. Well, can, can you be a little more specific? I mean, at what, what point do they get the grant? At what point do we find out, you know, roughly years? Um, you know, do we find out, do we notify them? How long was that process? versus how long after we figure all this stuff out did it take to bring it to the board? Just rough, rough approximations. Because I think there's, you know, the, the big contention generally is we charge this amount, which I agree with, okay? And I agree with the finding people at fault. But if we are found all this out and we made the judgment internally staff-wise three years ago, but or two years ago, and it takes us two years to get to our point to actually make it official, then that is kind of, may be debatable when that we were penalized the school district for that extra time because we didn't do our job faster. So I'm just trying to look at that angle. Um, Ms. Buchanan. Did, didn't we have a situation six months ago or whatever where we either shortened or waived the time of self-certification upon the uh, district paying the penalty in full? Ms. Moore probably would remember that. Oh. You would say you're, you're the um, you're the I, institutional I, memory. Yeah, I know. I I we, it was Chula in San Francisco. Yeah. Okay. They paid the the losses. Well, they paid the penalty, and the board was still making some recommendations or held up the the termination of losses self cert. So that was in abeyance for about a year and a half. And when they came back to the board, the board decided to waive the losses self cert because they had been in abeyance for a couple of years. Yeah. So, you know, I don't. I mean, ultimately, I, um, the, losing self-certification for five years when they have to pay more money and we have to pay more money on our side, I mean, um, I, I do have, you know, some sympathy there. I think, if I recall, there was one where they offered to, on futures, to actually a attach a copy of the contract mm -hmm. so you could see that they had yeah. a contract, and I don't know if that is the solution, so I'm, um, you know, uh, willing to talk about that. We've had other discussions about how we speed up the audit process, but the penalty is just, whether the audit takes a year or five years, the penalty is just based on that period okay. um, yeah. in which the, uh, the, 
that, yeah, the, the yeah. material accuracy happens. So if you had the money in the bank, you actually would be earning interest on that. So, um, so I don't think there's you really get penalized from our not closing out the audit fast okay. enough. The real question. That's, why I want to make sure that's yeah. exactly right. The real question is. You know, is there any latitude? And I believe there is some latitude in terms of the self-certification. I don't know whether it's something we should look at because it affects more than one district. But, you know, at a minimum, um, I think we should have it until the fine is paid. Right. I think the, the uh, yeah, I think the, uh, the 540 is not in question. I think the question is the, the leniency in the self-certification. I think that a district this size, the 540, is a significant penalty, no question about it. So I'm kind of satisfied with that as terms of being a deterrent. I think the self-certification, I'd like to know when we would have been ready to hear this issue and we did not hear it. And I would be okay with starting the clock then in terms of the five-year period. So if it's a couple of years ago that you could have come before the board to hear this issue then, you know, and I don't know what the exact date is. So if uh, folks would be okay with something like that. I'd make a motion to that effect. Thank you, Ms. Brownlee. Is there Mr. Hagman seconds. Can you come up with that particular date? It's probably a couple of years from a couple of years ago or something. We'll, we'll go ahead back and research it. Do you, would you like us to bring that item back next month just for the loss of self-cert? I, th I think it's, we're saying don't start the clock now. Start the clock from when this thing would have been ready, and I think we will be ready to move forward to the next issue. Ms. Yeah. Brownlee? Uh, yeah, I just, um, and maybe Ms. Buchanan already asked this, and I didn't listen well enough to hear the answer, but it, it, are there other districts that fall in the same category previously where we didn't give them, you know, the credit because we were, late in terms of hearing it so I, I and whether we need to go back yeah i think it's going to come up you know as because different districts are going to raise different issues uh some districts are going to challenge the interest we had that without i don't want to name names but somebody just south of here that really challenged the penalty and how we did the calculation and to me that's a different than somebody who's willing to say here is some re i'm ready to write the check and we recognize that we there was an error but, you know, it took you guys a while to hear my case. Let's, can we move No, forward? I think the, 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 uh, the point is well taken, and that's why I made mm -hmm. the motion. I'm just concerned about other districts who were in exactly mm -hmm. the same situation. I mean, because really the intent here is, is kind of twofold. One is the interest payment itself, and one is the certification. Mm -hmm issue um, so anyway and I and I also don't know if the certification issue if it can be handled without loss but requiring those districts like I said to attach a contract or something so you know that they're well I, I believe this issue is is very old um, if you look at when these projects were first probably apportioned it's in the t the early 2000 yeah. range and the the issue that we dealt with as a board was that we were then subsequently years later um, finding it and what we what I believe staff did and I hope that this is going to eliminate um, but there will be a point at which it, um, we put into effect that you had to actually write down the the date of the contract and previously that wasn't on the form and so it's a way of prompting districts that you're writing down the date of the contract you're 50 percent under construction it was hopefully to alleviate this problem going forward in the future and I, I bet we'll have a group that's still back from the 2000s that's going to run into this but I would hope from the date we had that we that the staff made that recommendation and changed their form from them forward that, and because of all the, the information around it, that districts would not be in this similar situation. Can I clarify one yes. thing? I apologize. Um, and perhaps I did misspeak on the length of time that this project was ready. This project was actually ready to probably move forward at the board. It was just resolved in the end of December. And perhaps I got my facts mixed up with other prior material inaccuracies. So um, it was likely teed up and ready to go. Um, from December. So it was nine, ten months ago. Right. Okay. Right. Right. But you know, technically, you're right, Miss um, Moore. We actually did institute a process, I believe, back in 2007, 
to some extent we made changes to the form. We actually tried to prevent these issues from happening in the future and catch them early so when they do provide the fund release request they have to provide the contracts in place so we would avoid these issues. So I mean we're just probably dealing with probably the last few of those issues. Okay, so Ms. Brownlee, the, it would all, they shaves off about nine, ten months off their, I think that's the best we can do, and, and Mr. Hagman second that. Is, is that, everybody ready for a vote on this? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Ayes have it. So we're just taking nine months off the five years. Yeah, okay. since whatever December. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Item 10. Okay, item 10, page, stamp page 110. This is to request the board find that a material inaccuracy has occurred which resulted in a funding advantage for the Lake Elsinore Unified School District. Additionally, to request to levy the statutory interest penalty and loss of self-certification penalty. During an expenditure review of the community day school application, 50 75 176 0 it was discovered that the district falsely certified on the fund release authorization. In these instances, statute requires the OPSC to notify the board so that it can make a determination regarding material inaccuracy. Staff's research found the district did not enter into the required amount of binding contracts until 11 days after the funds were released. By falsely certifying the fund release authorization, the district received a funding advantage on the project. If the board finds that the district has a material inaccuracy, the board shall require the district to repay a statutory interest penalty of $11,394. Now, there's been some previous board actions at the December 2005 board, and if you would go to page, stamp page 122, which is attachment B, the district was allowed a one-time exception to use fees associated with construction management contracts to be counted towards the fund release authorization submittal requirements. The board action required the district to repay approximately three quarters of a million dollars in interest penalties due to, the inter, uh, due to the district receiving funds prematurely. Additionally, as a result of the board's decision in 2007 regarding construction management, CM fees are now counted toward the fund release authorization submittal requirements if it was signed before December 31st, 2003. Because the fund release authorization was signed before December 31st, 2003 for this project, the OPSC has included the CM contract toward the submittal requirements. Even with the inclusion of the CM contract fees, the district still has a premature fund release. The district's position is they don't dispute a premature fund release occurred, but contends the district submitted the fund release authorization under the assumption that entering into a binding contract with the construction manager was sufficient. The district maintains special consideration to be given to the district because this project should have been included in the appeal presented to the board on December 2005. Additionally, because the premature fund release was unintentional, the district does not believe it should lose its self-certification privileges. Now our response to that is that they do acknowledge that there was a premature fund release. It did result in a funding advantage for the district. In preparation for the December 2005 SAB item, staff worked extensively with the district. The district was asked to review all of their projects with premature fund release issues. The district did not identify this project as having an issue. Our recommendations are, on the bottom of stamp page 118, find that a material inaccuracy occurred which resulted in an early release of funds, require the district to repay $11,394, prohibit the district from self-certification on project information for a period of one year until September 28, 2012. I'm open to any questions you may have. May I hear from the district representatives, please? Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the State Allocation Board. My name is Greg Bowers. I am the Assistant Superintendent of Facilities and Operations for Lake Elsinore Unified School District, Riverside County. And with me today is Mr. Bruce Hancock from the firm Hancock, Gonos, and Park. First and foremost, I am grateful for the opportunity to address you today. In an attempt to keep my remarks brief and to the point, I have prepared a written statement for your consideration. I do ask for your patience and understanding as this matter before you is of the utmost importance to Lake Elsinore Unified School District. The purpose of my appearance today is to present a simple request asking only 
for the State Allocation Board to reject a material inaccuracy finding and support an audit exception allowing the district to return interest in the amount consistent with regulations and as calculated by the Office of Public School Construction. This simple action would preserve, respect, and honor the decision made by the State Allocation Board in 2005 for 13 other Lake Elsinore projects. It is our humble opinion that there is no need to further complicate this matter by revisiting the construction management debate, nor would it benefit either party to debate a connection between our request and the 2007 Santa Maria argument which attempted to clarify the role of construction management or the more important and relevant 2010 Temecula Valley argument taking the position that a construction management contract does in fact constitute 100 percent of the project. The State Allocation Board overwhelmingly supported Temecula's assertion and found that there were no false certifications, no material inaccuracies, and no penalties. Our argument is based on a collaborative effort between two agencies, Lake Elsinore Unified School District and OPSC, to sort out unclear policy issues that began to emerge as the school facilities program evolved. Based on those parameters, and in the best interest of OPSC and the district, a mutually agreed upon compromise was developed. That principled compromise was supported through the action of the State Allocation Board in 2005. For reasons unknown, the project in question today, the Community Day School, was unintentionally left off the group of 13 projects that were approved between November 2000 through February 2003. Clearly, it was in the best interest of both the district and OPSC to bring forward all of the affected projects. Both agencies cooperatively reviewed their respective files to make sure that no other project raised similar concerns. Unfortunately, the Community Day School project was not identified at that time. I would remind the board that it was the district who brought the original 13 projects to the attention of OPSC following an audit workshop conducted by that agency. This led to action involving 13 district projects in 2005, which in turn led to the board's approval of a compromise in which 11 of those 13 projects were assessed as interest charged and all 13 were found not to have committed a material inaccuracy. The full amount of the interest for the 11 projects was repaid. The point I am trying to make is that this 14th project was part of the projects affected by the circumstances addressed by the State Allocation Board. As you can imagine, the district is perplexed at the recommendation of OPSC as this matter was clearly resolved by the Board in 2005. We again reiterate our position that this project was part of the compromise. It was one of a group of projects with identical circumstances and identical timelines which led to the compromise. I am assuming the State Allocation Board members have been briefed on the complex issues concerning this item as well as our earlier projects, the 2007 Santa Maria argument and the 2010 Temecula decision. Therefore, in the name of brevity, I will not burden you with a lengthy argument about why I believe there is no material accuracy on this project or on the 13 projects addressed by the State Allocation Board in 2005. I want to emphasize that the Board did not create a window period or an amnesty period at that time. Instead, the Board agreed that unclear policies created a situation that warranted compromise to avoid a pointless material inaccuracy finding and the associated stigma for a false certification that did not happen. The 14th project is part of that same group of projects and should be given the same consideration. In 2005, the State Allocation Board made a compromise based on unclear policy. 
not to follow the decision of the 2005 board would be inconsistent with the facts of the agreement. To be clear, the compromise was an audit exception in lieu of a material inaccuracy with the district paying interest which made the bond whole. Penalties are associated with a material inaccuracy, not an audit exception. The district did pay interest in the spirit of cooperation and compromise, and we are willing to pay interest on this project as well. We're ready to write the check tomorrow. In conclusion, all we are asking for is the same consideration that was given in 2005. I believe this request is reasonable and just. However, if the board is not in agreement and so desires, we are prepared to make the Temecula argument here and now. Again, I thank you for this opportunity. We are prepared to answer any questions at this time. Mr. Hagman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is when I spend a lot of time looking at the different things going back and forth. I know my staff has been contacting. And one, I appreciate the, the staff's position to follow the rules and then we bring, to bring them up to us to try to decipher what is the fair thing to do on this. You know, I looked at the history. I believe, uh, like Elsnor, did bring this attention on their own. This is not something that we had to go out and sneak out and find them. So I'm prepared to make a motion. We can have as much discussion as you like. But uh, I believe the difference between the interest and the penalties, 5,000 or 11,000, and the biggest thing that's on issue is the self-certification. And I would move to to basically charge the 5,000, not pull this to self-certification. A second. Well, Okay, moved and second. And just for clarification, is the five thousand and change, whatever the yeah, interest it's, amount on it's, it's five thousand ninety eight dollars. Five thousand thank you. I knew it wasn't precisely five, so I want to make sure. But charge me an extra two dollars because you didn't have a check today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you want to put your mic your mic? Your mic? To be clear, there's no material inaccuracy and no um, loss of self certification, correct? Okay, I, I, I agree with you. I think I view this as had it been discovered back then, it would have been part of the package. And for whatever reason, it fell through the cracks, both on their side and on, this, on OPSC side. So I think it's reasonable to just treat them as an audit funding as we did back then. Um, but just on that, I just don't want to make sure that folks don't get the message that if we discover some material inaccuracy later, we're going to be treating it as an audit finding because we did this one. I think it's in a case-by-case -case basis, and this should should fall under the 13, the original 13, that they move forward, that they brought forward to us. Ms. Right. Buchanan. This one is unique because of the construction and management situation, right. correct? Right. So, and I don't know if you want to add that into your motion that you're making the recommendation due to the- The Hagman's to your right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, whatever the consensus is, I'm fine. It comes out the same result, and I'm sure the minutes will reflect that. And um, so okay. modify it whatever way we need to. Okay. Yeah, I, Ms. Brownlee. I, uh, I um, will support the motion, and um, but I just want to say that I think the school district really acted in good faith from the very, very beginning. They were the ones to, to bring these forward in the right. first place. And having um, met with them today in my office, understanding, too, that when this 14th project surfaced that they looked at other projects and had OPSC look at them mm -hmm. to make sure um, that they didn't fall into the right. same category. So I just want to commend them for um, their uh, good faith and uh, management over, over these projects. Okay. Well, all in favor say aye. 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 Oppose? Abstentions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and honorable board members. Uh, item 11. Item 11 begins on uh, page 127. The purpose of this item is to seek board direction on how to proceed with approximately $287 million in bond authority remaining in the overcrowded relief grant program. The $287 million represents the remaining ORG authority from the original amount of $1 billion approved by the California voters back in 2006 through the passage of Proposition 1D. As you all know, the ORG program is basically a portable replacement program for school sites that demonstrate a high pupil density as calculated by the Department of Education. At the December 2010 board meeting, the board had a lengthy discussion on whether to fund additional cycles in the ORG program. Ultimately, the board did open up two additional funding cycles, one ending on January 31st of this year and the second ending 
on July 29th of this year. The board also directed the staff to come back in September in order to see what the demand was for those two funding cycles and then make a determination on future funding cycles. On page 129, we have two tables listing all the funding cycles, applications per cycle, portables replaced, and total funding approved. The first table in the middle of the page represents all of the funding cycles that have been approved by the board. In total, the board has approved approximately 595 million so far. At the bottom of the page, we list the applications that were submitted as part of the eighth funding cycle, which again closed on July 29th of this year, and are currently being processed by staff. We show a preliminary request amount of 118 million. Given what's been approved and what we're processing now, we will have a remaining amount of $287 million in authority. So staff is seeking board direction on, on two options. The first option is basically to continue the ORG funding uh, by declaring additional funding rounds. If the board wishes to pursue this uh, option, staff is seeking board direction on basically how to implement the rounds. Uh, for example, the board could approve each funding cycle before the beginning of the next cycle, or the board can approve multiple funding cycles not to exceed two per year as required by statute, and the board can approve future funding cycles on a continuous basis until all of the remaining bonding authority is exhausted. The second option is basically to take no action and to not open any additional funding cycles under the ORG program. If there is an interest to transfer the remaining ORG authority into another program, that would require legislative changes. Uh, with that, staff is seeking board direction. Mr. Hagman. Uh, Mr. Chair, so I guess that you just nominated us to a committee to look at some of these funds that it may behoove us to, to add that to the agenda and maybe come back uh, some ideas to the full board and hopefully whenever we set these things up, the sooner the better, um, to look at both the remaining funds at all the different accounts as well as what do we go on next year. So maybe an idea to add option C at this point or B modified or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> option two modified to actually take, you know, not take any action today, but put it on the agenda to figure out the path for this and many other things we need to work at. Ms. Moore. Um, I, I, w I would um, respectfully uh, have the other side of that, and that is that these funds are available for overcrowded relief grant program. The only way that they couldn't be available for that is by legislation. And so I would like to see the program move forward. However, if there's, if there's legislative will to change it, that at the time that legislative will happens, then, then the program takes its knocks. But until then, I think that we would want to encourage projects to come in, and I would want to support at least one, if not two, um, additional funding rounds until such time. I don't think going to the committee will change that fact. And that's why I'm thinking that the committee could talk about it, but let's move forward and encourage projects to come in because these projects, you know, relief, relieve overcrowded situations and portable situations on campuses where students um, may not have access to play field areas because they're strewn with portables and um, this program was intended to fix those situations. Ms. Brown. Um, I would support that if that was a motion and I, uh, with one change, I think you might have said it already, but um, to in essence, um, ex you know, continue to um, uh, put forward the funding and also this third, the third bullet here about uh, continuous um, to process the applications on a continuous basis as opposed to two times per calendar year. So just continue on and, uh, con and so we, on a continuous so we move basis. it out even more expeditiously. Yes. I would, I would support that. I just want to get clarified from Steph. I, I heard you say we have statutorily two so why do we have two and then you have a continuous as an option? Basically until the funds are exhausted, until the remaining authority is so exhausted. So two a year until, two a year yes. until the, okay. Right, okay, okay. Okay, anybody else have other input? I'd like to hear, I do have input. Okay, please. 
Good afternoon, Chairman Reyes, members of the board. My name is Janet Dixon. I'm the Director of Planning and Development for the Riverside Unified School District. And as been alluded to, the ORG program is a very important program. This allows districts to remove portables from school sites that were never intended to be a permanent solution and free up space for physical education or, or other spaces that are needed on the site. Um, as you've probably surmised, Riverside Unified has a project that they would like to submit for a future round. Liberty Elementary was built right after World War I. And as you can probably imagine, it's gone through a number of construction and deconstruction cycles over the years as Field Act's been implemented. And it's eventually led to where it is today, a uh, campus of over 900 preschool through sixth grade students on a six acre campus. And a num large number of those are housed in portables. Um, I know the money hasn't gone out as quickly as was originally anticipated when this program was put together, but that shouldn't be mistaken for a lack of need. The need is still there. With the economy, districts have had trouble assembling the local funds that they need to uh, uh, provide a match. And at Riverside, I've just recently been able to cobble together a number of sources to provide our match and allow this project to move forward. I'd like to encourage you to schedule at least two funding rounds. If only a funding round in January was to be scheduled in order for a project to be able to be ready to be submitted in January, the project would already have to be in DSA. And um, that wouldn't provide districts an opportunity to get their plans together and submit for for the project unless they had already made a huge commitment without already having um, some assurance of a future funding round. Uh, so I'd like to thank you and just encourage you to use the ORG funding for the purpose that it was originally intended and thank you for your time today. Thank you. Good afternoon, Margaret Brown, uh, Administrator with Glendale Unified School District. Um, Glendale Unified has taken advantage of uh, a number of fundings from the ORG program, and we actually have two schools in for funding in this current round, round eight. And we'd like to continue to see the ORG um, funding continue to happen. Glendale Unified is a school district that um, is very urban. Many of our schools have actually no green space, no grass for the children to play on at all, no parking for teachers or visitors. They actually park in the neighborhood. No pickup or drop off. They actually cone off the street lane in the morning and in the afternoon for the kids to be picked up. And the reason for that is because the portables have taken over all those spaces. And the ORG program has allowed us to create the parking spaces, to get the portables off to go, two story. And it's amazing what happened. I invite you to come out and take a look at our Roosevelt Middle School that just completed at the end of this summer. I had nothing to do with it. I just came in at the end. But it's a wonderful program. And there will be parking and there will be drop off and pick up and places for students to play. It's amazing what the change has done, not just for the students and the teachers, but for the entire community. It's safer. The other thing is that um, these projects, um, are it's hard for us to move forward with projects because we don't know if there's going to be another funding cycle. Um, Glendale Unified is lucky in that they passed a local bond in April of, uh, to, of 2011. They just passed a bond. And so we are ready to move forward with two more ORG projects. We actually have the money. We can move forward and design the next two ORG projects. But only if this board acts and says, yes, we're going to give you two more funding cycles. If you decide to do just January, we wouldn't make it in time. But if you do January and July, then we would have another opportunity to apply for those two more schools. And we really appreciate the program. Thank you. I have a question. Um, so where are you in terms of modernization or new construction eligibility if you were going to replace those portables? So we have no ORG? new construction. We have no new construction eligibility. We are declining enrollment school district. Um, the eligibility for ORG was established back in 2005, so right. that sort of stays there what your overcrowded capacity is. 
And um, we do have money for modernization, but a lot of our classrooms are in uh, pretty old shape, and so we're going through that assessment now. But again, we don't have money for new construction. We have no new construction eligibility, so we wouldn't be able to do it. You could apply, you could apply for mod money and do like for like replacement, but some of these portables are not necessarily over 20 years old. So it's very, very complicated, and we think org is the only way we get there in terms of improving, um, improving the quality of life for these students on our campuses. What, what percentage of the portables are 20 years old or older? I couldn't, I, I don't have that statistic for you. I'd be happy to provide it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Tom, how about you go first since you, you're prepared dress for the part instead of Lyle. <laughs> Lyle's too casual. Go ahead, Tom. He's bigger than I am. I don't care. Go ahead, Tom. <laughs> Can I borrow Tom's coat then? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Tom Duffy for the Coalition for Adequate School Housing. Just a, a couple of things. One is there's no downside for you to have this program continue by approving additional funding rounds. Uh, the, as as uh, I think that the, the sage advice from Ms. Ms. Moore, that this, they're, in order to use this funding, if that's part of the, the intent, there would be a requirement for legislation to occur. That, that was in the, the bond language. So there's no downside for you to continue and to allow districts the sense of some normalcy in this really uh, time of upheaval for K-12 public education, some sense of normalcy that there is a program, there is, there is a bonding authority, let's move forward and plan. And then to have bond sales to allow those projects to be built. And, and to, I, I'm not sure that the, uh, the genesis of, of uh, your, your question, but uh, Ms. Buchanan, this is the only program that exists that does not require new construction eligibility to have new construction occur. I understand that. And, and, and that was done purposely. This, this program wasn't as a result of a negotiated uh, settlement of the Williams lawsuit, but it is a result of what came out of that lawsuit where we we were finding in California that that the school sites were so overcrowded because of so many portables that there was only one way to get rid of them, and that was to say, let's get rid of the portables and build up or build an additional uh, school to be able to unload those schools. So there's no downside to the board. This was very good policy, and it was a result of, I think, good thinking after a substantial conflict, and that was the, the Williams lawsuit, which was eventually settled. But th those are my comments, and thank you very much, and I'm, I'm glad that I'm dressed for the occasion. Thank you, sir. Sure. Anybody else? Okay, Lyle. <laughs> yes, good morning. Or afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> I normally don't have a coat. I don't know what time it is. Uh, Lyle Smoot, Los Angeles Unified. I could just easily say ditto for us too, but well, let me thank just you, give sir. you a quick. <laughs> yeah, I know you'd like that. Uh, just real quick, you know, we've done a lot of construction under this program. We have built a school district the size of the second largest district in the, in the state, San Diego. We built that many schools in the last eight years. The goal, our goal in that is, is a whole bunch of things, but we've been able to come off of year-round. Uh, school programs as a result of that and now we still have even after all of that we still have almost 200,000 pupils still in portable classrooms some of them quite old this program is a great program to address that issue we definitely support the concept of just opening them up and having continuous uh, application cycles until the money's gone or until you know the legislature decides to do something else with it so thank you very much thank you Lyle Esteban and I'd like to uh, make the motion that uh, we approve two more, two new filing cycles. And that continues? Mm hmm So just two and then revisit the issue a year from now? Yes. Okay. Second. Been moved in second. To just do January and July? Yes, that's correct. And then come back in a year from now and look to see what we have left? Okay, that's a motion. Senator Lowenthal? I would, I would prefer to still do the third, the option three, to process funding cycles on a continuous basis. Can I, can I go right. To continue it on a continuous basis. Oh. Now, here we have many microphones, only one works. So. 
on a continuous basis until all available funding is, is completed. If we want to change it through legislative action, if that, that will change it. But I think to keep the process going, there can only be two cycles a year. We're not doing more than two, but we're just going to say continuous. We're going to do the two, and if there's still funding left over, we can go the, the next year, unless there's legislative action to say, hey, let's change this. Let's, let's do it another way. So I would like to keep it the way it is now, and that's the continuous uh, with no more than two a year. No two a year, okay. I, I'd like to speak against that. Okay. Only because two more cycles will take us, hopefully, to a November 12 bond issue in which case we'll have a much better idea of where the state is um, with respect to school bond funding long term. And it may well be that, you know, depending on if we get one on the ballot and uh, if it passes and what happens, you know, we may need at that point in time to take uh, an additional look at where we are with all of our funds. So but that I will mean, take I, legislative I, action, not us. If you want to change that, that's not ours. To change, I, under, I understand it would, but but I just think we ought to leave some options open to us. And the reason I say that, if these districts want certainty, you know, if if there is, they they we knowing that you're definitely going to have two more rounds is going to encourage districts to get their applications in. But you know, knowing that there are there's a lot of questions out there economically and everything else. And so, you know, I, I just would like to have, um, you know, some opportunity for the board to revisit this a year from now um, in case there are some adjustments that we may want to make legislatively. I mean, I know it requires legislative changes, but mm -hmm. there may, I mean, if you're all completely out of money, for example, in new construction and you can't pass a bond, there may be some serious questions that we have to I have a legal right. question then. Hold on, Ms. Brownlee was going. Well, I, I just uh, think that it's important to have a continuous cycle because I think it gives districts um, clarity. I think we've already established a subcommittee that's going to discuss some of these issues and make recommendations, but it would, at the end of the day, take a legislative change mm -hmm. and the legislative will uh, to do that. And um, so I think this gives um, districts um, absolute clarity, and um, I think if it's continuous and goes beyond uh, two cycles, then that's motivation as well for people to continue to do it unless things change otherwise. Okay. Ms. Ms. Moore, you had a legal question. Well, if we uh, take the action to do it continuously, and then doesn't legislation trump that action at, mm -hmm. at, if it passes at any future date? Of course it does. But if the districts want certainty and we take action and they think it's going to be continuous beyond 2012, I think you're taking away some of that certainty from the districts. I, I think that for me, I think doing it for two years and revisiting a year also provides um, an incentive for those districts who need the resources to come in and not try to wait until 2013 for it. Uh, you know, there's a, there's two shots at it. They know it's going to be January. They know it's going to be July, and they don't know what 2013 will bring, whether or not there will be need or desire to transfer the money. So that gets the shovel-ready projects moving. But that's just my. Well, I, I, I think that that probably does provide some incentive, but I, I, I don't think by having it being done continuously hurts the incentive in any way. I mean, for me, this in some sense boils down to sort of a civil rights issue. This is about overcrowded schools that are, you know, kids are crammed into mm -hmm. part of, uh, and I think that we should give districts every opportunity that they can to move forward with this. and. If it's, you know, not right on the money mm -hmm. um, and they would need a little bit more time after the fact, then um, so be it. Um, but I think, again, y y you know, ultimately this will take uh, a, a legislative action to do. And also with regards to hopefully, I hope that we will have a bond um, in 2012. Um, but I, I, as we approach that, this, this legislative cycle will have a better sense of that one way or the other. And um, that will also uh, signal, I think, to districts um, 
what's happening there. Okay, Senator Lowenthal. Yeah, I just want to know whether the author, you see, will accept as an amendment. Really what we're saying is until, let's send the message that we're not about to change anything right now with this, that we've had, this is the process that we have. It is continuous now. It is two a year until the, like, until the org, org money is used. What you're saying is you want to potentially revisit this. You have that option, again, whether we do this or not when we see where we're going. But I don't think changing the rules right now by saying we're only going to do two really is, really provides stability. I think it provides stability saying this is a program. We want you to get your applications in. You've heard this discussion, folks out there. If you, you there are some members of this that really, if we, are going to look at what's going to take place in that bond action or not in a year from now, and we're going to look at some of that issue. But I think that right now to send that message sends the wrong message. Right now, I think the message is this is an important program. We've heard from districts. Let's continue this program. Potentially in a year from now, we may want to revisit this when we see, but that's not really where we are right now. Right now, we want to continue this program as it is, and the funding, which is continuous, no more than two a year. That's where we are. And I think that's really the message that we should be sending. I think there's, from my perspective, there's a fundamental difference in terms of having a motion to continuously appropriate, because the motion that was brought up was beyond, you know, not limiting it to the next two, but we would continue with two a year indefinitely until the money runs out. I think that's a fundamentally different motion than having a motion to approve the next two. Well, if we didn't have next, any motion. The next two funding rounds, because clearly well, the, the, neither motion is, is, to, um, is to get rid of the program. If we, didn't have, if we don't have any, fund, any motion now, where, where are we? We do. We have a motion. I mean, if we, no, if we don't, if, oh. if this didn't come. Then the money's, money's frozen. frozen. So nothing is frozen, and we don't go out, and I don't think and, that's And I also I don't think want that's to point it. out right is, is Margaret Brown point. I mean, we, you do have, you know, a lot of factors that enter into the, the portables. Most okay. of the portables, we all know, were purchased back in 97, 98, 99 when we were dealing with class size reduction. You have a situation now where you, we're between districts that are in declining enrollment where you have um, schools that have additional classroom space because they're not able to maintain that 20 to 1 and others. We have some things that fundamentally are changing. So I, I can support and vote for a motion to authorize the next two rounds, even though my preference would be to, to wait till we t took a look at where all of our funding, what our burn rates are. But I can't support a motion to just um, continuously, uh, a, a motion that would um, continue with rounds indefinitely until the funds are Until exhausted. the funds are exhausted. So we have a motion for next two and revisit the issue. It's been seconded. Senator Lonthal had a substitute motion to do to continuously every two years, every two a year until the money runs out. Right. It has not been seconded. Oh, well, I will second you, it. I thought Ms. Moore had a motion. I didn't motion. I seconded. I seconded um, the motion that was made. The oh, okay. original. I thought that you had made a motion, and then when I talked about the continuous piece, you said that you would accept that as a motion, as a friendly amendment. I don't think, I don't think, Julie, that I made an official motion. I think the okay. official motion. And I'll, I will second uh, Mr. Lowenthal's okay. motion. Okay. So, so we have that. So let's take that one, which is to do continuous or two a year. But we're not it just says the board can direct. The direct staff to process funding cycles for board approval on a continuous basis until all available funding is dispersed. Right. Right. We need to do, because his is substitute motion. We need to dispense the with his. The first motion has to accept that. No, it's a separate, a different motion altogether. So we're voting on well, which motion? All right. First? So Estevan's motion is to do two and revisit the issue a year from now. Okay. okay. Senator Lowenthal came up with a substitute motion that says two a year until we're out of money. It's right. It's not a substitute motion because he's not substituting his for the first one, right? Well, he's, he's yeah. making an alternative motion. Substitute motion. That's a substitute motion. He's not amending his. He's not amending his He's He asked if he would take an amendment. He said no. 
And so he said, okay, then I want to move this motion. And, right. and it was seconded by second. Assemblymember Brownlee. And seconded. So we dispense with that and then go from where we need to go from there. Right. I personally like Esteban's uh, visiting in a year from now to see where we are. Uh, because then that doesn't commit us beyond the e next year. And if there's money and that's where we want to go, then we'll do it again. Uh, doesn't preclude us from doing that. And you're absolutely right, we can't transfer without legislative approval. I think that by going for next two rounds, it incentivizes folks to take advantage that we've been doing this since 2008. So I don't know that we're closing any windows from my perspective, but that's just me. So, Ms. Brownlee. Just, uh, one more statement um, uh, to the, is this the motion that's on the floor right now? No. Okay. This is on the floor. Well, to speak to this motion. Okay. Um, is and I guess to speak to our motion as well is I think that if if we end up doing uh, which I hope we won't um, this the, the second <laughs> uh, motion the original motion. the original motion thank you then I think that we I think that we will need to give school districts w warnings and to say that we've only done this for a year and when because I think that that would be a fair mm -hmm. thing for us to do. And I think by virtue of doing that, that signals to the school districts that this money is good for a year. It's now or never. And I now just. Now or run a risk. Now or run a risk. And I think we should err on the side of the districts who are doing their due diligence to move forward with this because I think achieving the results and solving overcrowded campuses is the right thing to do for children. Mm -hmm. And so I think by virtue of saying it's going to be for one year, that signals, okay, well, in one year we're going to come back and revisit it, and we might very well take the money away. And so, therefore, there's not going to be some potential planning that could take place. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I would characterize that as a disincentive. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hagen. I just, you know, I guess my two cents worth too. If we put out at least two funding rounds, we're 13, 14 months off. Any school district is contemplating getting bond money, whatever, that's fine. I would hope this board would come up with some recommendations for 2012 before even the second round comes out, much less wait until next November. I think whichever way we go probably is okay because we're going to be coming up with recommendations as a board. Hopefully we get our groups around it by next year hopefully earlier than later, to come up with some recommendations. So if you put out two, we're still looking that by the time we come back with recommendations in April, May, June, we can still give direction if we want to extend it for another year or if we want to do this or that. Either way, I think it will still give some continu continuous, you know, we got a full 14 months worth of funding here. You guys go out and get it. Um, we can come back in six months and we'll hopefully have an assessment. We'll have some plans we can put on the table as well. We can say we have no plans or there's no climate for anything else. Let's continue this. Let's do something else. But we would have to make changes by next summer to affect anything in November 2012 anyway. And so there's going to be a lot more discussion about this. And so I think we're talking a lot that either way we go, we may augment it and change it by then anyway. So either way. One final. More. I, m my final comment would be it was, it was the will of the voters that there was an overcrowded relief grant program and that we did not, like the critically overcrowded school program, put a um, caveat on that. And the caveat in the critically overcrowded school program was if the funds weren't used, it, will, it, would, autom it would revert to the new construction program. So when we put the program together originally, we said we are committed to this program. Um, unlike, we said, for critically overcrowded schools, which we could pull their money, and we have. So I think that speaks to a continuous program until there's a legislative will um, to change that. And I don't know that um, the board taking uh, action on that will, will, ever, will ever change that item until the legislature does. Maybe I'm confused, but if, in the past, you've authorized this one year at a time, correct? Right. So what are we doing now in authorizing it for the next year that any, that's any different that's been done 
in the past? I'll, I'll tell you what it was. I don't think we ever had discussions that we're authorizing it one year in advance because we are considering taking the funding after that. We never said that. So that's the difference. Well, um, I think I think the action is what's most important, and the action is to authorize the next two rounds. If you take a look at the burn rate, we may have very little money at the end of the next two rounds if you're burning it at $100 million a round. But in terms of the action, which is really what you're doing, you're authorizing the next two rounds just like you've been doing um, year to year. And I have no idea. I mean, all I know is we're coming to the end of this program. You can take a look at the amount that's been allocated in all the different funds, and we're coming near the end. We're in very difficult economic times. We, you know, all of us are going to, you know, work as hard as can be to pass another school bond. There's no, we don't know what the appetite for the voters is going to be. But what we're really doing in taking an action in, in authorizing the next two rounds is what we've done year to year. So we'll, you know, we, we look at it. I don't think there's any guarantee on this board that any money gets transferred or whatever, but I just think it, it's prudent right now for us to leave our options open um, entirely. Yep. So no one's, you know. Nothing can happen without legislation. Okay. So on Senator Lowenthal's motion, of two until the two a year until the money runs out. Call the roll, please. Lowenthal. Aye. Brownlee. Aye. Buchanan. No. Hagman. Almanza. No. Moore. Aye. Dabby. Same. Rays. No. Does not pass. Okay, so we go back to Almanza's RECO motion, and that is January and July of next year, and then revisit the issue a year from now. Yeah, yes, Ms. Brownlee. I, I think if, if this is the motion that's going to move forward, um, then I think that the July, when we say January and July, July is 2012, right? Mm hmm. So I think that I think that it would be important to um, give districts um, written uh, warning um, and um, just to let them know what this discussion has been. I think we need to be clear that it's you know again legislative will that can change mm -hmm. this. But um, the reason for this particular motion, I, I believe, is so that you can. Um, look at it and evaluate perhaps moving forward with legislation mm -hmm. um, to shift this money from from this account to to something else that's to me what I'm hearing is the intent for this purpose on this motion okay so so are you saying Ms. Brownlee that if we vote for this that we are also um, intending to potentially uh, uh, recommend that the legislature move this funding? No, I don't know what the outcome is going to be, but I feel as though the part of the intention around this motion is the possibility that there's a desire on this board to move money um, out of this account to someplace else, understanding that it would require legislative authority. And so I, I just feel as though we should be honest with folks to let them, to warn them, not to say that this would happen, but to warn them um, that it's it potentially, potentially now or never. I, I for one, don't. I just want to come back a year from now and take another look at this. I don't know that there will be the will, frankly, having worked upstairs or, yeah, in the legislature for 11 years. I'm not sure there's the will to take this money from overcrowded schools, frankly. I don't, I don't see it happening. And I think that the bullet here is to let us know that if the board wanted to, it would have to occur through legislation. We 
came across this issue when we did the cash management committee and some folks wanted to transfer some monies that were being underutilized. And we discovered why it was being underutilized. The seismic comes to mind and we try to correct, rectify that. I think that by looking at this, what I'm looking at is doing what we have done in the past and just reauthorizing that for another year. I don't view it as, gee, we ought to take it. Now, if the subcommittee in looking at it uh, thinks that based on the economics and based on the bonds and based on what the appetite is out there, that that should be an option that the board ought to, ought to consider, then at that point we will have that conversation. I don't want my vote on this particular motion now to be taken that I am for taking the money and putting it someplace else. I want a year to go by before I kind of arrive at that conclusion. That's just one board member. Mr. Hagman. I would concur with everything. I mean, I don't think anyone's talked about any kind of legislative will to do anything with it besides just continuing on appropriately, just like the rigor bond was, to put it out for another year cycle, two issuance, just like it is. We're making this thing so complicated. It's very simple. We're putting it out for another two years, for another two issuance next year, and then we'll come back and look at it for the end of the year. All these funds are out. They all take legislative action. If we want to add more money or transfer it, all this stuff has to be done. That's why we have a subcommittee. The subcommittee back will report the conclusions, any kind of change in demographics in the state, all the rest of it, the bond climate. Then we can make some kind of conclusions or recommendations to the legislature to go forward from there. All, I don't, my vote's not to reallocate it. I want to stay in this spot, too, which is we're going to have some, a lot more information coming out to us in the next six months. I'm just saying let's just do what we need to do to get this keep going and give some assurance to school districts that next year we're not changing nothing. That's it. And I, I've been most outspoken. I'm not recommending changing. All I'm saying is we're running out to the end of the bond funds, and I think it's prudent to take a look at it and operate year to year instead of making a decision now. And I, if I were a school district and I looked at how much was left over, I would probably be doing what Senator Brownlee um, is talking about regardless because we're talking about um, $287 million left in the bond and the, and the last uh, amount requested was $118 million. So if you go through two more rounds, you're pretty much there. Okay. So call the roll on Esteban's Okay, motion. Lowenthal. Aye. Brownlee. Aye. Buchanan. Aye. Hagman. Aye. Almanza. Aye. Moore. Aye. Dabby. Aye. Reyes. Abstain. No, I'm kidding. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> motion carries. Okay, we will skip the PIW for now since Senator Runners asked that we do that. We go on to reports. You know, I never did ask. Well, yeah, we did have public public conversation on that. What am I thinking? Yes. Tab thirteen is. Um, Staff wanted to share with the State Allocation Board. We were actually presented the audit report of, from the Office of State Audits and Evaluations, and they provided some report recommendation. Uh, basically, that final report was published on June 14, 2011, and it covers actually the fiscal year June 30, 2009. And with that, there are s several recommendations that are stated on stamp page 147. And, Attached also staff, staff actually provided a response on stamp page 159 through 163. There are a couple areas of deficiencies that were noted um, as far as evaluating the program. And with that. Thank you. I want to uh, first and foremost apologize to my colleagues on the board for not getting this letter out to you. I did not realize I had it. Uh, it was one of those things that got lost when it came in through my email and I opened in the BlackBerry and when I went back to my computer I never saw it again as an email so I would like to take full responsibility for not getting this to you. Uh, it's something that I should have shared with you a long time ago. But uh, anyway, so I just want to comment on that. And I understand there's some folks who want to comment on Other than David, anybody else?
Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Reyes, members of the board. My name is Kathy Allen. I represent CASH. I happen to be its current chair. Very proud of that uh, honor. Uh, we submitted a letter to the Office of State Audits and Evaluations in August in response to the report. Um, also went to the Department of Finance with copies to the individual members of the State Allocation Board. Um, regarding the audit of the Prop 1D funds, while we agree with uh, many of the findings in the report, of the report, we also highlighted some areas where we believe the findings seem to contradict elements of the program itself. In addition to the comments in the letter, CASH has specific concerns over several areas of the report, including one, what constitutes a high-risk project. There seems to be quite a dialogue around a high-risk project, and yet we do not have a definition of what that is. Second, how is it identified that there are an additional $4 billion in remaining high-risk projects left to be audited if we don't know what a high-risk project is? Third, how can the report identify $5.9 billion in savings out of a $7.3 billion bond and Prop 1D. I think there might be, maybe it's just a, an M instead of a B, but that seems to be a little bit um, incongruous right there. Um, fourth, why, why has the De Department of General Services and the Department of Finance not implemented the audit policy adopted by the State Allocation Board? I believe that was within the, within the last year, sometime in 2010. The report seems to indicate that estimates derived from the plan verification team process are more accurate than actual bid amounts. We're hearing quite a bit about this from the field. I also see it referenced in the report. Um, as we know, PVT estimates are, are estimates. Um, hard bid is hard bid, and we know what the dollars are at that time. And yet what we're hearing is that hard bid amounts are, are being challenged when they are coming in higher than what plan verification team amounts are. Um, sixth. How are the assumptions used in the report established? I think a clarification over, um, a clarification over what, what was done and, and how things were um, assumed would be helpful in trying to interpret the results of the report. And clearly there is just not a, re a recognition of um, the established program that has been in place for 11 years. Um, CASH, once again, offers um, help. We, we would like to sit down with OSE and um, see what we can do to maybe fine tune the, re the re Find, uh, findings of the report, and again, offer our assistance where we can. Thank you. Mr. Walrath. Chair of AS members, Dave Walrath, representing Small School Districts Association. To follow up on what uh, Kathy uh, commented as the Chair of Cash, within the executive summary of the audit, it references the savings amount and then it references that savings are to be used for other high facility, uh, important facility projects or return to the state within three years. It doesn't differentiate between the regular program, which has none of those provisions, and the hardship program. It is the confusion that is created by not differentiating or clearly differentiating or indicating an understanding of the school facilities programs and the nuances of the programs we're concerned that the audit, as it comes forward, uh, does not have the type of specification and specificity that would have been helpful. Quite frankly, as SSDA, we had hoped the audit was going to really be looking at not so much some of the financial issues, which we believe can be addressed totally by adopting the SAB's audit policy and actually implementing that by OPSC, DGS, and Department of Finance. We were concerned about some of the process issues. OPSC changes policy. But those policies are not always explained to the board when they change, nor always fully communicated to school districts. Consequently, the architects and the school districts go forward with their plans, go through and make their expenses, then come forward and are explained, well, we changed policy. Those types of things are process issues, and we were hoping process and procedural issues would have been part of the audit on how is the process and procedure for the allocation of 1D funds working, both on the structure of OPSC and how it's affecting the school districts. So we recognize that there are a number of audit findings. We believe the audit did not have appropriate specificity. And lastly, we encourage the adoption and implementation of the State Allocation Board's adopted audit policies and procedures 
that you went through on the subcommittee basis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walworth. On that point, I think uh, Senator Lowenthal wants to get the subcommittee get together again so we can uh, get yeah. to this I, issue. I, yeah, it's not just get together. I would like the, <clears throat> the newly appointed AEO, the Administrative mm -hmm. <clears throat> Executive Officer, to work with either OPSC and then either report back to the subcommittee, audit subcommittee, and then back on where we are in the yeah. implementation. Mm -hmm. We, as a board, talked about these policies. We adopted what we want to see in audits, how we want the independence of audits. <clears throat> in November, it's over almost a year, nothing has happened. We're now talking about another audit where they say, where even in their executive summary, they talk about how the State Allocation Board and OPSC have to work collectively to deal. Well, we have that process, and it's been almost a year, and we haven't dealt with that. So I am very concerned that there are concerns about this audit, but we have not really implemented our own audit procedures or that we have passed as a board. Actually, we passed every single recommendation of the audit subcommittee except for one was passed unanimously by this board, and none of them have been implemented. Now, I'm not blaming anybody because we lost an AEO, and there are lots of things. But, bef but that is critical yeah. to this discussion, that we, we have our own procedures that we hope to have implemented. Nothing has happened, and now we're talking about another audit that really is quite different from what we recommended. And I, I just share my frustration anyway that actions of this board have not been implemented. Lyle. Thank you. Uh, again, Lyle Smoot, representing Los Angeles Unified. I just want to speak to one simple issue uh, as it, that's in the letter uh, where the Department of Finance uh, OSE has indicated that the absence of timely uh, regulation amendments may result in inequitable distribution of bond funds. Based on the lack of progress, the current regulatory amendment process, including the use of the Implementation Committee, does not appear to be working as intended and is ineffective. I just want to state an objection to uh, saying that these problems are associated with the Implementation Committee. I think that committee has served this board very well has saved you a lot of time and effort and, and created a process that everyone thinks is, is open and workable, et cetera. And I hope that you go back to using the implementation committee because I, I think it has been a good thing and, and I object to the, the concept that the implementation committee is somehow being blamed for the lack of a regulation being adopted. That committee has no authority to stop anything or for that matter, to start anything. All they can do is provide in information to this board, and I think they've done a very good job of it in the past, and I hope you'll continue to use them in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Lyon. Anna. Anna Ferreira on behalf of the County School Facilities Consortium. Just want to be on the record as supportive of the subcommittee uh, recommendations being uh, addressed and adopted, we do believe that would prevent a lot of, um, would take care of some things before they got to a, a, an appeal or a board level, um, and we think that that process was a good one, um, and we hope that you would take those recommendations up. Also on the point of the Implementation Committee, um, we also believe that the Implementation Committee has been a very useful uh, model format for um, stakeholders to address issues that, um, you know, that come up between board meetings and also issues that may not be identified by the board but that may be identified by stakeholders. Um, we believe it's a good process and it's a consistent one that also keeps um, issues from burbling up to the board in ways that, you know, you may not um, like. Um, anyway, uh, if we can take care of those at that level, it would be uh, wonderful, and it's a regular process that we appreciate. The last comment I wanted to make was just about um, financial hardship. Um, I don't know if there's anything you're going to take out of that letter that may proceed with um, a review of financial hardship, but the county offices stand ready to assist on that level as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Uh... Moving on to the three-month projected workload, we want to add to that uh, a presentation. Wait, 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 wait. I need to understand what is going to happen. We have passed, I, I want 
some acknowledgement that the AEO is going to work with OPSE to, to find out where we are in the implementation of board passed uh, implementation prep policy. We passed policy, and the only reason I said to have a subcommittee is to get that report back from them and find out where are we and do we need to do anything. That was going to be my question because I think, Senator, you're chair of the audit committee. Yes. It would make sense for me to for you to have the audit committee take a look at your recommendations in this audit and, Absolutely. and you know tie them all together so we know where we are going forward. As long as we're, they're also dealing with the implementation of the of our recommendations well, to right. add that's, this. That's what, I mean, you, that's, could, you that's right. could certainly get a status of that, but that's I mean, right. it would be great to have someone who could actually uh, I would have, be get, welcome get to have committee a committee together again uh, we have the uh, I'd like the board to direct board us to do that and the AEO to work with us to give a report back to the subcommittee and have the subcommittee work on that and and this this the okay. uh, audit yeah. report I think we do want the subcommittee to take this issue on again and kind of do the up again not program. to take it on again to to talk about the implementation and this report Right. We've already taken it on after months of hearings. But to bring it to fruition. Right. All right. And work with the AEO, but the AEO is not here until the 19th, so. Well, we'll do it after the, next, the 19th. Uh, on the 20th, possible. we'll have that meeting. And All right. <laughs> Where is Mr. Savage? Where is he? Uh, uh, Senator Lowenthal? Yes. As the chair of that committee, call yes. your meeting as but I'm also saying we're also requesting that the be by that time the AEO having met with the yes. OPSC to be able to report to us where, where we, we are. Stand. Yes, perfect. Okay. All right. Moving. So that's the direction. Any questions of staff on that? And there's nobody at the AEO spot right now. But no, okay. I'm just kidding. All right, Bill. Um, Ninety day work. Tentative workload. We need to include the uh, AGs. I mean, the treasurers. AGs, treasurers. Um, he was the AG. Uh, the treasurers update on this, please. For October, and then DSA potentially in December. Uh, no, I don't think we can do October. I think we do December for the for the treasurer. No. no. October no, no. for the treasurer. Yeah. Sorry. And DSA potentially December. DSA January. in December. Yeah, right. that's right. The timeline. Yeah. Thank you for clarification. Anything else I'm missing? So we don't come back and say, oh, yeah, we meant to say this. If we mean to say it, let's say it. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, then the other stuff in here is just the uh, next meetings are October 26th and then December 7th. If you can let us know your availability for that one, because then we get into the holidays. So that makes it tougher. So thank you. Um, and then the usual stuff on the tables in the back, and I think we are. Mr. Hagman. I just question. I was going through the different unfunded list, the work list, and some of the, the ones at the very top of the list, like for unfunded program list, the first one's like a $40,000 type of thing. Is there absolutely no funds coming back in, going back out? As the funds come in, are you redistributing to the ones that have already been approved? Or is there just absolutely no funds at this point? I mean, some of those numbers seem pretty small in, in the bigger numbers we talk about. Well, I think last year what we, what we did was we actually shook out our couch cushions and we're checking for every source of funds available. And it was obviously more productive if, we, if there was coupled with the bond sale, any cash at that point in time, fold out that to other projects. Um, since we did establish a priorities and funding round, uh, that would actually clear the way once we have cash. Um, there is a very small portion of cash, and it's trying to figure out where to divide the lines. Um, that becomes really complicated. So well, we do have monies coming in, though, from projects that weren't fulfilled. I'm just wondering, there's a, uh, do you have any kind of triggering amounts? If you get over a certain amount, will you fund the next couple down without going through a formal round, without waiting for the bond sale, since we don't know when that is yet? And we are talking about trying to get these projects out. Is there a comfort zone that you like to keep in the account for things? Or is there, you know, as we looked at the previous charts, we're in October, November, we had a lot of projects that either need to be started or they're going to get some money back. And some of the projects on that timeline have come <coughs> in. 
so some of the projects didn't drop off like we anticipated so there is a timeline put together for the October and that should if those projects don't move forward that potentially could be about a hundred million dollars so, so if you had you know 20 or 30 or 40 million dollars come in would you do this through that administratively to start going down to the list again or do you have to go through a formal round or you're gonna wait for a bond and I'm just wondering what your thought would be that would have to be at the will of the board of how they want to execute I'm, it, releasing and, some of those funds but I, I know I hear what you're saying it should be a free uh, free float process um, yeah we're, it's just, we're in the request for a funding round right now aren't we we just wrapped up the certification so we have 1.3 billion dollars in requests that came 3. in right right yeah it's just I don't know what the direction would be but if if I knew I had a bunch of money in the account and I had some like the first ones I think it was 40,000, next one's 279,000. I mean, those aren't big numbers. If we had two, three, four million sitting in the bank, let's get them working. You know, I hate to have them wait another six months or five months or whenever we have a you know, bond issuance or something like that to, if we had the money sitting in the account, they'll go ahead and get it out. And just didn't know what administratively you had set up for, we keep this much in, in the account so we don't close the account out or something comes up but we're going to if we have these monies coming in is that something we can give you authority to just kind of do administratively at certain levels or something to think about anyway do you have the flexibility to or do we need to give you direction that in no, the event we do. we do you do what we do have the flexibility okay since we just wrapped up the certification mm -hmm. round we now we know clearly what's the requests are going to be and if those folks that are on the certification and we have the cash to liquidate they obviously have to come in you know to perfect within 90 days but we can bring those projects in for apportionments say potentially by the next board okay thank you all right well thank you uh, any comments from the public hearing none meeting adjourned thank you everybody Good.